That is a very powerful and poignant question today. Do you know my Jesus? And to everyone here today, I want to tell you that eternal life is predicated on you knowing Jesus. Amen. Not knowing about him, but knowing him. And Jesus Christ tells us in John chapter 17, I believe verse 3, this is eternal life. It's knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ whom God has sent. And I pray today before we leave here that no one will leave without knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I don't know your heart. I can't see your heart. Uh, but in a congregation this size, it is most likely that there are several here who have not been saved, who are unprepared to meet the Lord. Uh, several of you have asked me this morning if I'm ready uh, for revival, and the answer is no. Uh, I never feel like I'm ready. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to a good week. Amen. And I'm hoping in the course of this revival meeting this week that I, as well as all of you, will be drawn into a more closer walk with the Lord. That's revival. Amen. Revival is a life-changing experience. Um, I've been through some good meetings. Um, can't say that they were revivals, but I've been through lots of good meetings and went away sad that didn't see the results that we would hope for. But I'm praying this week, and I know you are too, that this revival will be successful for the honor and glory of the Lord. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 25 today. If you have a Bible with you, and I hope you'll bring your Bible, I always want to encourage you uh, to bring your Bible, have your own personal copy of it. It is a great blessing from God that he's given to us that we can own our own personal copy of God's inspired word. I have a, an edition that I've been using for many years that I'm familiar with. I'm disappointed because they've discontinued this particular model. And uh, when, when all of my uh, different copies of this particular model wear out, then I'm going to have to start with another edition of some kind and try to figure out where everything's at on the page again. But anyway, uh, you should have your own copy of the Bible and be familiar with it. I'm going to read here in just a few moments. Just, so just hold on to your horses for just a little while. The Oxford English Dictionary um, every year is revised. New words are coined all the time. And new definitions for existing words uh, come into existence as well. Uh, at present, or at least at the time when I googled this question, how many words are there in the Oxford English Bible? 171,476. Um, I can only speak about half of that many. No, I'm just kidding. 171,000 different and plus different words in the English language. There are just 41,000 words that have become obsolete that we don't use anymore. And every day people take words that we're accustomed to and give a new spin on a new, new definition to it and use it in a brand new way. Uh, teenage slang is uh, really responsible for a lot of that, I suppose. Uh, but at any rate, that's why it's so important for us to study our Bible. And when we study our Bible, study words. Because it's important for us to know what thus saith the Lord in its context when it was spoken, when it was first delivered. Very often, words change meaning and when we read them today, we don't really get the whole meaning of what God's word is saying. A uh, word that has come into play here recently, um, in recent time anyway, I guess probably in, the, in our culture, in our, maybe the political realm, people talk about snowflakes. 
We know what snowflakes are. I've been seeing them ever since I was a little kid. There's little white things that drift down from the heaven when it's cold uh, and blankets the world and transforms it into a, a winter paradise. Well, recently a snowflake has been defined as a person who just cannot endure something that comes along. I remember reading about a man in prison suing the state in which he was imprisoned by and it amazed me, Brother Donald, that that was even possible. Uh, but he was suing the state because they gave him smooth peanut butter instead of crunchy. Yeah. A snowflake is somebody who just can't live with smooth peanut butter. It's got to be crunchy. And that gives you an idea of what they refer to as snowflake. And snowflakes think that every time something comes along that just doesn't suit them well, that the end of the world is coming. You know, it's just the end of the world. I cannot live. Well, the title for my message today is The Sky is Falling. The Sky is Falling. Um, the Sky is Falling, I think, is a familiar expression to all of us. Um, maybe some of the young, youngsters maybe haven't heard it yet. But when somebody says the sky is falling, they're really saying the end of the world's coming. This is the end. And this expression, the sky is falling, comes from uh, an English folk tale that is more than 2,500 years old. It's been told and, and retold in various different versions. The English version that most of us are familiar with is the story of Chicken Little. And it seems that when a, an acorn falls and hits Chicken Little in the head, he comes to the, he believes that the sky is falling and comes to the conclusion that the world's coming to an end. He goes about the farmyard and, and he starts telling all of the different animals there that the sky is falling. The world's coming to an end. And as he shares the story, the, the other farm animals, they begin to follow him. And as true to, true to form in our, in our world today, folks, people are always crying, the sky is falling. The world's coming to an end. And they, they, they garner a following. And just like the little children's uh, story, uh, Chicken Little, he gets a following. And when they come to the wolf and tell the wolf that the sky is falling, he says, well, come in here. And the story ends with all of those farm animals disappearing. They just disappear. But the message is left. The sky is falling. I want to tell you today, on the authority of God's word, the sky is going to fall. Amen. Now, it's unknown, it's unknown who wrote this story, who came up with this story. The origin of it is unknown. And I'm going to add to that the, the motive for the story is, is virtually unknown. I, and I'm going to speculate here. And, and it's just me, and you can take it for what it's worth. But I'm going to speculate here that it very possibly could be a disparaging attempt to cast doubt upon the message of God's Word. That the end of the world is going to come. That in fact, the sky is going to fall. And it is. It is. Now on the authority of God's word, I'm going to tell you when it's going to fall. Just, so just hold on. Just hold on for a little while. In our, in our culture today, we, you know, for, for so long we've been hearing about global warming. The climate is heating up, heating up, heating up. And I enjoyed our discussion in the Sunday school doc about science, you know, and there's real science out there, folks, that the planet is not heating up. That, that 
that, that warning, that sky is falling concept. And, and folks, listen, people have been crying the sky is falling for years. Have come up with, with some reason to think that the world is going to come to an end. Uh, we've heard warnings about the overpopulation of our world. Too many people on the planet. I read not long ago, well, if all the people stood shoulder to shoulder in this world, that they would just barely cover the whole surface, I think, of the, of the island of Hawaii. We're living in a great big world. And what, there's some close to 7 billion people on the planet? That's a lot of people. And we've been hearing warnings about overpopulation. We've been hearing uh, warnings about the, uh, uh, the, the loss of resources. You know, we're just gobbling up and using all the resources. One of these days we're going to run out and the planet's going to come to an end. The end of the world's going to come. Well, they've been warning us about global warning. Now it's pl uh, climate change and tomorrow it will be something else. Did you know, though... The beginning of these kinds of warnings wasn't global warming, but it was global cooling. Yeah. If you begin to, to research these, these warnings, uh, I believe it was um, Frank Sinatra, old Blue Eyes, in 1967, he sang a song titled, It Was a Very Good Year. Well, 1970 was a very good year for the environmentalists and for a, 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 a political a leader, U.S. Senator Gaylord Nelson, who came up with the idea of Earth Day. And in 1970, just listen to this for a moment. In 1970, they held the first Earth Day. Uh, celebrated in eight, April uh, 22nd, 1970. And since then, they've been having it every day. And I think about 193 countries in the world now are involved in, in, in Earth Day. And a Nobel laureate, professor of biology at Harvard, Geo Wald, George Wald, predicted that the civilization, civilization would end in 30 years. Yeah, he said the world was going to come to an end in 30 years, 1970, 2000. And, you know, we, we all came through Y2K, didn't we? Amen. Yeah, we survived. Praise the Lord. We all ought to get T-shirts. George Wall predicted the world would come to an end in 30 years. 1970, Stanford University professor of biology Paul Ehrlich said population would exceed the food supply and that 100 to 200 million people would starve within 10 years. And in the same year, ecologist Kenneth Watt said the world has been chilling sharply and by the year 2000, the earth would face another ice age. 1970, a very good year. Dylan Ripley, secretary of the Smithsonian, said because of the ice age conditions, 75 to 80 percent of all living animals would face extinction within 25 years. There's probably been a few species that have passed and gone. Moving on, in 1975, Nigel Calder of Wildlife International predicted the threat of a new ice age, that it was inevitable, that it was absolutely going to come to pass. And 1975, C.C. Warner of the World Meteorological Organization reported the cooling of the Earth's climate since 1940 has continued long enough to suggest it will not be reversed. Finally, that was finally. They were warning that the world was going to come to an end because of global cooling. And they blamed deforestation for the cooling. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe they've been blaming deforestation for global warming. And now climate change. And there's been somebody in the world nearly all the time claiming that the world is going to come to an end. And brothers and sisters, you know the story. Preachers, since the days of Noah, have been warning the world that the end is going to come. And, and Jesus tells us in his, in, in his sermon on eschatology, 
But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And, and people have been warning about the coming of the Lord in one way or another. And, and, and Malachi speaks about the great and the dreadful day of the Lord that is going to come. I want to tell you today when the Lord comes, it's going to be a great and wonderful day for everybody that could raise their hand. Amen. And say, I, I've been saved by his marvelous grace. And, and I'm looking forward to that time coming. But it's going to be a dreadful time for those who have not listened to the words of God. And Noah for 120 years preached the word of God and told men to repent, to get ready to meet the Lord because it was going to rain. They'd never seen anything like it. And they, 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 they just rejected his message. They ignored the warning from God until the day, Jesus said, when the flood came and it took them all away. Jesus says it's going to be like that when the Son of Man comes. Now right here, brothers and sisters, typically is where the minister, be it myself or some other pastor or uh, evangelist or missionary, might begin to bear down on the lost within the congregation or the assembly and warn them Plead with them to get ready to meet the Lord. But I want to make my appeal today to you that are saved. To you that are saved. I have no idea why Chicken Little was ever written. I have no understanding of the motive. But I can only guess that it was to disparage of those men of God who for years have stood and warned the population in their day that the Lord is going to come, that the, that the day of the Lord's vengeance is going to come, and that the end of the world is going to come because God's word has predicted it. And what better way to cast doubt upon the message of God than to counterfeit some other message and to cloud the atmosphere with lies. Now listen, Peter tells us in his writing, we're not following cunningly devised fables. These are not fairy tales, but he said, holy men of God, they, they preached, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And these things have been written down for our learning, for our admonition to warn us about the, the truth of God's word so that we would not be found unprepared to meet the Lord. Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 25 this might be one of the last sermons that our Lord and Savior preached before he died on the cross. It took place sometime between the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem uh, within that week when he finally uh, was ultimately taken and tried uh, and, and condemned and, and crucified. It happened within that time frame, within that week. I don't know that it was his last sermon, but it was close to the end. And so this is some of the last words of our Lord and Savior in his last hours upon this earth. And he warned his disciples. They were so enamored with Jerusalem, this magnificent city. And Jesus told him, I'm telling you, Everything that you see here is going to be thrown down. There's not going to be left one stone upon another. And it stunned them so greatly that they came to the Lord while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you can sit on the Mount of Olives and you can look right over into this glorious, wonderful city. It is a magnificent cityscape. Even now in our time, the Lord was sitting there and the Lord's disciples came to him. They were stunned so badly. They thought, surely if this happens, the end of the world is going to come. And they asked the Lord, when are these things going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They wanted answers to those three questions. And in the words that follow, Jesus gave them the answer that they were looking for. And I want to tell you, in this sermon of last things, in our Lord's last sermon, in his last few hours on this earth, in, 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 in this sermon of last things, the Lord told him in verse 25, 
Matthew 24 and 25, behold, I have told you before. He said, I'm telling you these things before they happen so that when they happen, you will know that it is the truth of God's word. And he said, he goes on in verse 29 and he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he warned his disciples, look, he said, there's going to be false prophets are going to come. There's going to be false messiahs are going to come. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famines. There's going to be disasters of every kind. But he said, the end is not yet. Uh, and, and he went on to tell them that this gospel would be preached unto the end of the age. And then when it was that the end was going to come. And he says here in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will, will be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory brothers and sisters do you realize the time that we're living in? Do you realize the time that we're living in? God's inspired word closes with, with the message of Jesus saying, behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his works. And he tells us, surely I'm coming quickly. That was 2,000 years ago. Now listen, on the authority of God's word, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44, Jesus tells us exactly when the Lord is going to come, when the end is going to come. At a time when you think not, the end will come while men are eating and drinking. And they, they, they fail to, to recognize the truth and, and obey the, the voice of the Lord. He tells us that the end is going to fall suddenly upon us at a time when we're not looking for it. How many do you suppose are really seriously expecting the Lord's going to come? Thank you, Lorraine. I see a couple hands go up back there, just barely, just barely. I mean, they didn't go up like this. It's kind of like, like the, well, maybe. Yeah, I, th I think it's possible. It could be. Folks, I'm telling you, we know what thus saith the Lord. We know that God's word reveals to us before the end comes. There's going to be a great falling away. Do you realize that we're in it? Amen. We're living in a time of a great falling away. Uh, the, God's word tells us that men will not endure sound doctrine. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. Do you realize we're living in that time right now? You know, listen, so many people, they're claiming Christ. They're professing faith in Christ. They don't care nothing about doctrine. They don't care anything about the Bible. They just want to love Jesus and have a good time. Never mind the truth. And we're living in a time when men just will not accept or believe or endure sound doctrine. They reject the true and living God and they're worshiping the creature today, just like Paul said in the first chapter of Romans, they've rejected the creator to worship the creature. Amen. Yes. Yeah, 1970 was a very good year for tree huggers. And people are worshiping the creature Today, they think more of the animal species than they do the, the human species. And, and God help us, we all know that. Uh, they're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. They have left the natural use of their bodies and they burn with lust. Men for, with, with men and women with women. Uh, they become reprobates in their mind and, and they're damned to strong delusions. And perilous times, Paul said, are going to come such time as men have not seen before. That's right. It's exactly right. We are living in those times. God's word is virtually fulfilling itself right before our eyes. And who's alarmed? We're concerned, but are we really, really, really alarmed? And brothers and sisters, we know what God's word has to say. God said, vengeance is mine. Vengeance belongs to me and I will repay. Do you realize today, listen, men have always uh, aborted children. 
Men have always disposed of, in some way or another, unwanted children. Yes, we read about the horrible idolatry in the Old Testament where, 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 where whole communities would, would, would burn their, their, their infant children to idol gods, uh, thinking that they're appeasing God. But I think rather they were just disposing of their children so that they could go on in their sinful, idolatrous, uh, and, and, and uh, pleasure ways. Just, we don't want to be burdened with these children. We want our life. We want to live the way we want to, and they've disposed of their children in every age. It's happened in every age, in every country, in every culture. Do you realize that in every age, in every culture, men have practiced homosexuality that they have left? It's in our, it's in our Bibles, for heaven's sakes. In the very uh, uh, New Testament scripture, Paul warned about people becoming that way, that they don't have any natural affection at all. It's always been in the world, but do you realize never in the history of the human race has there been a time when it's been legalized? Amen. Amen. Listen, Solomon wrote about He wrote about the way of men with women. Uh, he said, there are four things that just amaze me. Um, I think one was a bird in the air. One was a serpent on a rock. Another was a ship going through the sea. And the last was a, the way of men with women. And he talked about a, 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 an adulterous woman, a, a prostitute. That she would eat and, and, and drink her food and wipe her mouth and say, I've done nothing wrong. That's the time that we're living in, brothers and sisters, right now. Amen. Right now. We're living in an age where men are, are calling good evil and evil good. Listen, I'm conflicted about this message. I'd rather be preaching about heaven and God's saving grace. I'm really conflicted about this. But, and, and our lost children, they need to be warned to flee from the wrath to come. And believe me, it's going to come. It's going to come on these United States of America. It's going to come on a nation that once was one nation under God. Heaven help us for where we are right now. But the wrath of God is going to come. He said, vengeance belongs to me. And he said, I will repay. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we ought to be afraid. And the righteous are going to suffer with the wicked. We can read the book of Daniel and see that is true. Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they were righteous, faithful men, but they suffered the captivity there in Babylon because of the sins of their nation. And you can read Daniel's pitiful prayer, Lord, have mercy on our country. We have sinned. Our fathers have sinned. We have sinned. I have sinned. We have legitimized sin in our time. We're living in a nation that is day after day rejecting God and legitimizing sin and calling good evil and evil good. You can see, I believe it was uh, de Blasio who signed in, into effect uh, this, this horrible bill of, uh, of abortion right on up to birth and even after, and then smiles after signing the bill. Just like the, 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 the adulterous woman in the Old Testament wiping his face and saying, I've done nothing wrong. Strong delusion God is sending on this generation that they should believe a lie and be damned. And brothers and sisters, listen, God's word tells us that, that, that the time is going to come when the sky is going to fall. The stars are going to fall from heaven. Peter said that, that men are, the scoffers will come and we're living in that time where people scoff at the truth of God's word, uh, at blasphemers, and they're saying, when, where's the promise of his coming? Nothing has changed. Everything continues as it was from the days of our fathers. But Peter said, look, God isn't slack concerning his promise. Amen. We can thank God today that we're serving a long-suffering God. Amen. He's waiting, but mark it down. The day of Almighty God is going to come. And Peter said this old earth is going to pass away with a great noise. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. 
And brothers and sisters, Revelation tells us that when that day comes, men are going to run to the rocks and the mountains, and they're going to cry that those rocks and mountains would fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits upon the throne. Do you know who that is? Do you know who that will be? Our fathers, mothers, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, co-workers, it will be people that we know. It will be people that we know. I confess before you today, I need a greater burden for lost humanity. I need spiritual revival. You might ask, preacher, do you really think the Lord could come back now? Let me answer it this way. Brother Larry Thomason sings a beautiful song. I used to love to hear him sing it, Donna, I Believe Jesus. And I'm telling you today, I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus. I believe every word of this sermon that he preached. I believe the stars are literally going to fall from the heavens. I believe the sky is literally going to fall. And as those stars, as those stars fall with all of their, their, their incredible heat, and they pass by our solar system, our planetary system. I'm telling you, the elements of this old solar system are going to melt away. The, the heavens and the earth are going to come to an end with a great noise. But, but what's going to stand is God's word. It's going to be true. And in, in that day, every eye is going to see the Lord and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it'll be too late. It'll be too late then when the stars, when that first star begins to fall, it'll be too late then. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand that this could be our family members, people that we know and love and are associated with in our daily lives. And I believe Jesus that it could happen in a moment. I believe Jesus left us with just enough information to know that his coming is imminent and it could happen anytime. Anytime. So, how important is this revival meeting? How important is this meeting this week? Pentecost started 50 days after the Lord's ascension. In that upper room in Jerusalem, with those 12, possibly 120 disciples, it started right then and there. Revival. Um, you know, I thought about this. I thought, no, it was vival because they didn't really need to be revived. They were already fired up. But you know what? Any time that people experience the power and blessing of Almighty God, it's revival. Yeah. From Adam's fall, we need reviving spiritually. We need spiritual renewal. We need a spiritual relationship with the Lord that needs to be renewed every day. That revival started right then and there, swept through the Roman Empire. Uh, in the 1740s in, in the American colonies, in, in, in New Haven, Connecticut, I believe it was, uh, at some, some point in time right there, Jonathan Edwards preached a powerful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Just a little spark and a revival took place that just swept through the colonies and transformed them, uh, I believe prepared them uh, to become the nation that we have become today. Praise the Lord. In 1801, the camp meetings took place uh, just up here north of us in Kentucky, Cane Ridge, Kentucky. God's people came from all over the southern states in wagons on horseback and gathered in there and began to pray in the preaching of Barton Stone and others. It touched off a great revival meeting, the second great awakening in this country. I believe 1853 in New York City, of all places, Jeremy Lamphere gathered with a handful of people for a prayer meeting, began to pray for this nation that was in shambles morally, spiritually, and in every way, and a great revival meeting took place. That's why we have Wednesday night service now because of that revival meeting that took place beginning right there with just a handful of people. Reckon what would happen, brothers and sisters, 
If all of us made this revival meeting a priority this week, all of you, every single one of you who are saved have the potential to hold the key. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting all my eggs in this basket. My hope is in the Lord. But we have a responsibility, those of us who are saved, to warn our family members. If they're not here today, they need to be. Our children, our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, whoever they are, they need to be here. And if we don't go after them, if they can't see some sense of urgency, some sense of, of real passion and conviction and fear and, and dread that the God's almighty wrath might be poured out upon us, how in the world will they ever be saved? I think that's probably why we're not seeing so many people saved in our time. Is just that we've lost our first love, our, our passion for God. And our, our, our second love is our passion for lost souls. Lost souls. I'm going to quit. I know you're glad of that. Stanley, if you would, I, I love this. This is not an old song. This is, a, this is a relatively new song. This, this is contemporary Christian music. It's called The Altar. And it tells us in, in the words of, of this song, that's what this altar is for. Men, women, and children. Listen, I've grown up in a Baptist church like this my whole life. I can't remember a time. Revival changed my dad's life. Revival changed my wife's life. I was there the night that she was saved in revival meeting. I've tried to demonstrate to you over and over and over how important revival is. How many people get saved in revival meeting. I was saved in a revival meeting. My dad was saved. My wife was saved in a revival meeting. And so many others are saved in a revival meeting. I've been in revival meetings till 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, lying in the altar with people, pleading with, with God to save their soul. It's not a pretty sight. I promise you, it's not a pretty sight. But oh, I'd give my right arm to see it. It's what we need. It is a needed sight. I remember Matt Tucker laying on the altar over here for hours one night in a youth um, lock-in that we had. And I mean, he was crying, pleading audibly. You remember Susan? I mean, it was painful. Yeah. Many got out right away. I mean, they just didn't last but a few minutes. And I'm telling you, after a while, I wanted to leave too, but I couldn't because I knew this boy was in trouble. That's where our lost children need to get is in trouble with God. And brothers and sisters, that's where we need to realize that we are today in trouble with God. In trouble with God. I'm going to invite you to come to the altar while this song's playing today. Just come quietly. Come sincerely. If you're saved, you know what the altar's for. Lost friend, if there's any trouble in, in your heart today, if there's any inkling that you know that you're lost, you need to make an altar somewhere to God. It may not be this one, but you'll need to make one somewhere and get in touch with God until you know Him and He knows you and you know you have peace in your troubled soul. That's salvation. Brothers and sisters, we need revival. We need help from Almighty God. And I'm going to invite you to come and pray. You can sit on the altar. You can stand. You can sit on the, on the pews up here. You can kneel on the floor. You can lie down on the floor. You can pray out loud or you can pray silently. I don't care. But let's all try to get in touch with the Lord before we leave here today and appeal to God's mercy. Appeal to His mercy. Who knows? Who knows, Joel said, whether God will repent and turn and leave a blessing behind. That's the blessing we need.